Good morning, and welcome to those who are here and to those who are online. I am so glad we can worship together today. It is perfectly fine to shout praise to the Lord here anytime you want. You can shout now, you can shout later, you can so don't just sing it. Anytime you want, you can shout it. So don't feel shy about that around here. Nobody's watching you. We're concentrating on the Lord right now. We'll be sharing uh, communion in a few moments. So if you haven't or you forgot to pick up your little communion cup because you were in, deeply immersed in fellowship at the beginning, you have a chance now while I'm talking. And I would like to share a few announcements this morning before we dive into uh, the start, the continuation of our worship time. If you didn't know, it's been announced a couple times and, and mentioned in uh, Faith Life and some other places. At about 9 o'clock to 9.30 every Sunday morning, there's an informal prayer gathering in the room that's considered the preschool room right back there. It's a time where we come and pray for one another and pray for the service and pray for our community. So if you are an early riser, and uh, it would be an, an encouragement, it's an encouraging time to come and pray with one another there. Speaking of encouragement, it's been announced a few times. I'll announce it again on Saturday, April 29th. That's in a few weeks. It's like a week and a half. Um, at 6.30, Franklin Graham, who many of you know is an evangelist and a leader of Samaritan's Purse Ministry and many other things, he is having his God Loves You Tidewater Tour evangelistic event right up the road at Charles County Fairgrounds in La Plata, which is about an hour away, not quite that far. There is no charge. This is an excellent event to invite a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a stranger uh, there. If you would, if you're planning on going, you know right now you're gonna go, would you just drop a note to Emma in the office? Because there's probably an opportunity for ride sharing since we all kind of live down here and come from here. So that would just kind of be cool or put it on Faith Life that, hey, I'm planning to go and I can take a couple people um, unless you have special plans for that. If you want to be super encouraged about the event after service today, go talk to Fred Hepler. Fred, raise your hand for those who don't know. Go talk to Fred Hepler. He went to the worker training last week that is associated with this event, and um, he, he's going to encourage you when you hear about uh, all of that. So it's going to be a great event. Um, it's really mostly for people who aren't churched, and so uh, trying to invite some people who aren't just our normal here every Sunday about Jesus friends. Our facilities here, which God has blessed us with a large number of them, they don't clean themselves, and they're big. And our faithful custodian janitor is headed off to college. And so the trustees are looking to hire a new custodian janitor to clean all of these buildings here on this campus and would love to hire somebody either from our body or somebody recommended by someone in our body. The job opens this summer. If you are interested in applying or you want to get the application, the information to a friend or somebody you know, please contact Emma in the office and she'll send you a job description. Those are the announcements and one of our special activities this morning is we're going to have Julie Warner and Lance Talk come give us a missionary spotlight on our friends, the Powers. I guess maybe just Lance. Julie's with you in spirit, my friend. So, so Julie actually made the slides, <laughs> but I'm the one who is presenting them. Uh, it's a good morning, though, so I'll be presenting our missionary spotlight for Chuck and Kathy Powers. Um, many of you probably remember they were here just this past summer when they came to visit us. Uh, next slide, please. Emma. Excellent. So we have a, they have a lot of good things to praise since the start of the last year when we first heard from them. So they have had a total of 50 people attend their annual business meeting. Uh, 40 of them stayed for uh, the meal, and they had a total of seven new members. And in their own words, this is the best that their church has been in the past 13 years. So praise the Lord for that. Um, the only major issue that they would like to bring up is that the only small thing that have, well, not small thing, the only issue they've been having um, is that their church has been struggling uh, financially. That's the only weak part of their ministry. 
and they continue to ask for prayers for their body um, to give thoughtful giving from their heart to help support their church. And next slide, please. Uh, more good news is as they going on with the theme of their church being the best they've been the past 13 years, uh, many of their members have been taking their faith very seriously. Uh, Janine, for example, or Leticia, for example, has been witnessing to her neighbor Janine, and they've been encouraged by an elderly member of their church to, to begin witnessing in the streets of Boulogne. Uh, next slide, please, Emma. Okay. And as of February 13th, every other week, they've been going out and evangelizing in the very same streets of Boulogne. Um, they, they ask for prayers that people's hearts would be open as they continue to witness. And they also pray um, for protection, as, as you all might have experienced in your own lives or in your own experience with church. As things start to get good, the enemy tends to throw a wrench in things. So they ask for protection as they continue to witness, as they continue to become better disciples of Christ. And next slide, please, Emma. And the next update is their gymnasium. So if you guys all remember from last summer, they've been building a gymnasium for community outreach purposes. Uh, at the end of this month, it's going to open, which, which is a huge praise the Lord moment for them. Uh, they've been working for, ooh, I can't remember how long, but over the past year or two, uh, getting this gymnasium built up, and it's finally going to be open to the community. Uh, they asked for prayers that, there will be people willing to come to the gymnasium. Uh, they ask for volunteers to help serve with them and also for wisdom and discernment as they begin setting up the various programs, asking the Lord how they want to use uh, this new asset to, to serve him. And finally, they want to just give uh, some thanks to us at SACIF. They've been, uh, the church has been open in France for the past 35 years, which is a super long time. That's that's older than me. <laughs> and they wanted to thank everyone for all the support that they've that you guys have all given them for the past 35 years. And that's it. That's for that's all that I have for today's the missionary spotlight for Chuck and Kevin Powers. Thank you, Lance, and thank you, missions team, for working diligently to keep us um, well informed uh, as to what it is that the various missionaries that are supported directly from this church are up to. We're now going to move into our time of giving, and as we enter that time of giving, I'd like us to consider what um, we see in uh, what the Lord himself says about giving in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. This is ESV, and he, <clears throat> so it's talking about Jesus. And uh, he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. How's that for accountability? Many people, many rich people, put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put two small copper coins, which make a penny. Put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to them and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Jesus marveling at the faith that this woman displayed. So, as we go into our time of giving, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, compared to the riches we have in you, we are all poor widows with only our two small copper coins. But Lord, we humbly ask that you accept our meager gifts and offerings, that you might accomplish through them so much more than their face value. Please use them to enable both the ministries here to our local community but also the ministries abroad, like we just briefed with the powers, that in all the places um, that these resources go to bring the gospel, that you would multiply and you would, you would 
be using it to seed, water, and harvest, that the life-changing hope of Jesus would be found by more and more people. Father, we specifically ask that you strengthen and encourage Chuck and Kathy Powers, and also Ben and Michelle, who co-labor with them out there, that in France, through the work that's there and through the believers that they have um, brought to you and you have matured there, Lord, that the, that the word of Christ might go out forth, that there might be a revival in northwest France, unlike has been seen since Re- Reformation times, that that would become a place where uh, many come to faith in you and, and take the message around to all the places that um, it hasn't been in a while. So, Lord, we do ask that you'd bless them and, uh, and continue to support them beyond even what we uh, give here. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. So we now move into our time of communion, first communion after we observed resurrection, celebrated Resurrection Sunday last week. And so let us continue our focus on Jesus, our risen Passover lamb. I ask that you would consider with me one more time, if it pops up here, the verse, one of the verses, one of the many verses we considered last week, John 1, 29, where he stands and says, or where we read, the next day he, John the baptizer, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We celebrated that quite a bit last week. I don't want us to forget. You know, John the baptizer was killed before he could see the resurrected Jesus on earth. And well before God gave the apostle John revelation on the island of Patmos. And therefore, John the baptizer was not able to proclaim that which we sing in our songs nowadays, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. So as you eat your bread this morning and you drink your juice in your own time, I ask that we'd each crown him with many crowns of praises. Crown praises for the worthy resurrected lamb seated on his throne. Father God, we are, we are awed and inspired and we continue to remember our Passover, our risen Passover lamb, that we remember the body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us, and we proclaim it until you return again. So Lord, now please accept our praises, whether they be silent, whether they be shouted, as honor for you and help us to rejoice in the hope we have in the returning risen resurrection Passover lamb. Amen. stand. Let's spend the next 10 minutes together just lifting up some praise and worship to our God in music. The first song has some shouting in it. 
as we were talking a little bit this morning with uh so fortunately, if we're all doing it, we have no reason to be embarrassed because we're all doing it together. So let's go and get started.
are dismissed to Sunday school. Morning. Mic check, mic check. Last Sunday was, oh, Resurrection Sunday, yes. Um, today, April 16th is, well, yeah, week, yeah not, re not Resurrection Sunday. Um, so what should we do? Well, what, what book of the Bible describes, this could be like called getting back to work week, you know, after Easter Sunday. What book would describe what happened after Jesus was resurrected? That would be the book of Acts of the Apostles. Acts involves a lot of action, right? It's about doing. Uh, the book's not called the Philosophies of the Apostles or even the Doctrines of the Apostles. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. It's about praying together and miracles and missionary journeys and standing firm under persecution and being witnesses for Jesus, first in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and finally to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's lots of sermons in Acts. Many of them are evangelism sermons, compelling people to trust Jesus. For example, in Acts chapter 2, we have Peter on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 7, we have Stephen before the Jewish leaders. Some of these sermons led to many conversions. Some had less fortunate outcomes, like stoning. But many of these sermons had a similarity. They had an audience with a common background. Jewish people, very familiar with the workings of Jehovah God throughout Abraham and Moses and David, etc. what we call the Old Testament. And because that was the audience, the sermon givers, Peter and Stephen and others, focused on how Jesus fulfilled those Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. That was important to their listeners, who were eagerly awaiting for the Messiah. Eagerly, eagerly awaiting, but catastrophically had missed him when he came. Now, today in Southern Maryland, think about all the people you meet. How many of them are Jewish? And not just Jewish by culture, but very familiar with Exodus and, and Isaiah, people who were still eagerly awaiting for the Messiah. Did you even use the word Messiah or hear the word Messiah outside of church context in the last month? It's, it's not a common thing. So how directly applicable to us as maybe blueprints are, are the sermons in Acts chapter 2 and 7 because we often don't meet a lot of those people. Do you start to witness for Jesus by speaking of the, about the promise to Abraham and the Passover and how the Israelites left Egypt and they failed under the judges and they were excoriated by the prophets like Amos and Micah for not exhibiting justice and mercy? You don't do that? I mean, it worked for Peter. It worked for Stephen. But again, different audience. In North America, 2023, we run across people who, they might be open to spiritual things, a lot of them, but they're often not open to church. Typically, they don't have much Bible background, so starting in with, well, you know, Genesis says this and Romans says that, and they might glaze eyed over you, and uh, it might not be getting through. And so the the sermons of Acts 2 and Acts 7 by Peter and Stephen might not be very comprehensible by a lot of the people we run into. In fact, it might be off-putting, if I can use that formal expression, uh, to some of them. Well, so, what should we do? do? Do we have a model, a template, an example in the book of Acts of how to be witnesses in a crooked and perverted generation that we're in? And I'll suggest this morning that Yes, we do. We're going to look together at how the Apostle Paul rapidly switched tactics when he came across such an audience and how this could be a template for you and for me 
on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So, we ready? No, we're not ready. After we pray, then we'll be ready. Let's open in prayer. Father, these ancient words that are ever true, may they change me and you. As we come today with open hearts, let them impart to us. Lord, please guide us today as we work out the proclaiming of our salvation with fear and with trembling, because it is you who is at work in us both to wish and to to do according to your good purpose. Help us to be blameless and pure as children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom we are commanded to shine like stars in the world by holding firmly to the word of life. Teach us today how to shine brightly and effectively and boldly for you and to honor the name that is above all names, our Savior, your Son, Jesus. In his name we give you thanks. Amen. Acts chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 15. Acts 17, beginning in 15, and the narrative takes us through to verse 34, the end of the chapter. Acts 17, 15. Yeah, it wasn't that many years ago. Everybody turned pages. <laughs> and now you're all turning your phones. I know it. Okay. Verse 15. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. I'm sorry. That's 16. Back to 15. Excuse me. 15. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. So Paul's been journeying throughout the Roman Empire, cities of primarily Greek culture and thought. But each city, he first he goes to the local synagogue so he can proclaim to the Jews. Sometimes the results are encouraging, other times not so much. But here he comes to Athens, and now he's alone. They leave him here, and he's waiting for his friends, Timothy and Silas, to catch up. And so in verse 16, as I read before, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. Well, no shocker that Paul was distressed that these are pagans, right? They're worshiping false gods. The key question here is, what did Paul do upon being distressed? He, He had a few options, right? He could have... Let's say first, he could have just closed his eyes to the sin and, look, I'm just going to go right back to the synagogue. These sinners, they might corrupt my pure mind, so I'm just not dealing with them. That might be a pure sort of righteous answer, but it would have been very caring. So he didn't choose that option. His second option could have been, all right, we're bringing the fire and brimstone. Repent or burn, you pagans. Which would have been true, but not very loving, and perhaps not all that effective as a first gesture. Or Paul could have tried to smooth over his distressed mind by trying to get them to, let's blend in Jesus along with their idols, kind of we call syncretize or mix the gospel in with their pagan religion. Maybe they'll get a little Jesus in with their stuff. Well, that would be what we call heresy. So Paul didn't do that either. What did Paul do? He chose a different approach. Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Saturday I'm talking to my Jews. The other six days I'm talking to whoever shows up out in town. He reasoned with them. And we'll see this reasoning approach, it's going to be a different kind of reasoning in the marketplace than it was with his Jewish friends. The same truth, but a different method, because it had a different audience with different background. Same bottom line, though. All right? Verse 18, here we go. 
some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. What was the bottom line Paul got to pretty quickly? Jesus rose from the dead. Didn't go over other philosophies and stuff. No, Jesus rose from the dead. This is the key because the resurrection proved Jesus' deity, right? It's that his sacrificial death provided for our salvation, but his resurrection confirmed that salvation was really available. So Paul quickly got to, here's the key point. All right, in verse 19, continuing on, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? So there's a big word here. And depending on your translation, it's translated much differently. Some say Areopagus, some say Mars Hill. Well, that's two pretty different words. How do we get that in your Bibles? So let's talk about the Greek and Roman God pantheon for a minute, okay? Greeks and Romans had lots of gods, right? One of the Roman gods was the god of war and other stuff, Mars. And the Greek sort of equivalent god in their pantheon, god of war, is Ares. Now they had set up a place outside of town on a hill where they worshipped Ares. And it was on a hill, so they called it the Hill of Ares or the Hill of Mars or Mars Hill. And in Latin, the hill of Ares comes out, Arius Pagas, Areopagas. So, same thing as Mars Hill. I can pronounce Mars Hill real easy, so I'm going to go with Mars Hill. <laughs> Whatever your translation says is fine, but I'm going to read it as Mars Hill. So they come out, they took him, let's go out to Mars Hill and talk about this some. Verses 20 and 21. Because we, what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Uh, this sounds strange to us. Well, the gospel may indeed sound strange to some people. A man claimed to be God and came back from the dead. That sounds just as strange in 2023 as it did in A.D. 51. But many of the people, they, they wanted to hear and understand, right? It says they, they, were, they were seeking. And so remember that, because that's going to become an important point in a few verses. They had a desire to add a new insight to their current understanding. Their current understanding was quite flawed, but they wanted to get some more insight. So, there's an opportunity here. So, verse 22, Paul begins. Paul stood in the middle of Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. Let's stop there. Paul opens with a compliment. Now, should you or I say something positive about a lost person's flawed spiritual understanding? Doesn't that sound, that doesn't sound right, does it? Can you compliment people in their bad theology? Paul just did. Why did he do that? Because he saw a light. They were, there was an opening there. They were seeking, and so he used that little bit to build on. And two, he began to wet their appetites. He gave them some salt to make them thirsty, which is what Jesus told his disciples, and, and but by extension told us to do, right? Be salt in the world. Paul found a connection point so he could bring the gospel in effectively. Now, we could do that. We could find someone's love for their family or, or their dog or whatever cause they care passionately about as an opening to 
then change the subject and say the, the real love. That's just a picture of the real love that comes from God who loved us. And all of our care for others is just a big picture. Or whatever creative opening we might find. So an exhortation I've got here is wet people's appetites for the good news. Paul said, you guys are pretty religious. Okay, we'll start with that. Verse 23 through 25. For as I was passing through and observing the object of your worship... Paul took time to notice. I even found an altar on which it was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives everyone life, and breath, and all things. So here's the template, my friends. Start with someone's limited understanding and provide clarity. Point to the truth from where they are. This I proclaim to you, Paul says. So if, if people are trying to worship a God, for example, who needs them to earn their salvation, you go explain grace. God doesn't need anything, as Paul says. He doesn't need our time. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't even need our worship. Our worship is due him. He doesn't need it. Or maybe you run across someone who is following fate, you know, some kind of deism that pervades the world in general. Well, explain to them a personal God who cares about them, understands them. Because you know, many Americans in our day, they would say something like, well, they, they're, they're spiritual, but they don't really know much about what the Bible says. Well, that's a lot like what Paul's running into here, isn't it? Kind of religious people, but very ignorant. And so Paul can start there, and we can start there. So Paul's approach to this audience, I think it could work for us. Here's a point to consider. Paul took the effort to go and check these things out and get to know his audience. Do we know our neighbors, our coworkers well enough that we can find a point to connect with them on? Paul, we're going to see in a few minutes, apparently knew some Greek literature. Where did he get that from in his Pharisee background? I don't know, but he went and found it so he could find a connection point. And without that, he wouldn't have had his entry point here. So if you care, if I care about reaching the people that we know, we'll spend some time getting to know what makes them tick and what they care about. And I think this will be more effective than simply dropping off a tract. Dropping off a tract, you might say, oh, I did my religious duty this week. You know, I witnessed the people, right? But no, how do we want to be effective? So Paul did that here. Paul continues his speech. Verse 26. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Brothers and sisters, it took me many times reading this verse before I grasped some of the truth of what it says. I'm not claiming I know all the truth of what it says. I'm just saying it took me some time to digest a lot that's here. There's a lot in this verse. There is a lot in the next short verse also. Now, maybe you're going to be a quicker study than I was. But I just like to say, if what I tell you in the next few minutes doesn't go down easily the first time, I'm going to ask you to withhold judgment for a bit and give it some time to chew and swallow because it took me a little time to chew and swallow before I was understanding all this, okay? Verse 26, it speaks about God's providence, right? His sovereignty. He's completely in charge. He created two people from dirt and after that they reproduced 
And pretty soon there's people and people everywhere. And God fashioned each person in their mother's womb, it says in Psalm 139. And God appointed or determined where each group of people, and by extension each individual person, would live. Their date of birth, the place where they grow up, their family situation. By God's will, each of you in this room exists in Lexington Park, Maryland on April 16th, 2023. At this point, you might be saying, okay, Tom, God is sovereign. I, I got all that. Not, not new information. Okay, let's keep going, though, and drill this all the way to the end. God also appointed or determined there will be other people born a thousand years ago to some wandering Bedouin tribe of herders who might never hear John 3.16, clearly. He appointed or determined that today there are people, there are boys and girls growing up in places like Yemen with seemingly no gospel witness, in Mongolia, in North Korea, in Cuba, or nearby us in an abusive home where love is absent, or in a family in our area where Jesus and his followers are mocked and scorned regularly. Well, how are those people going to hear and respond to the gospel if God put them there? And if Jesus is the only way to heaven, is it fair, is it just, is it loving that God puts people in places where it, it seems like they don't have much opportunity to follow him? This is one of the classic objections to the Christian gospel. How about the poor guy in wherever who hasn't heard? How can you say he's lost? It's a classic objection. And Paul answers it. Isn't that good that we had an answer? Verse 27. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Why did God appoint a time and place for every nation and individual? Well, here it is. So that. He did this so that people, the people who he created, whom he loved, would reach out to him. He put you in your time and place so you would say to yourself, well, there is a higher purpose in life than just, than just me. Uh, God exists. I, I need to find out who he is. God is love and he wants people to respond to his love. Now, this concept of people reaching out to God, trying to find God, groping to touch God, which is all the concepts that are involved in that Greek word that's um, translated reach out here in, the, in my CSB version. That's a hard concept. It's a challenge because you have to reconcile it with some other verses, right? Some of you have verses going in your mind. Things like, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked out of Jeremiah. Or, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone to his own way from Isaiah, which tell us that, that we're lost and, and we're not seeking God. Okay. But there are also phrases in our Bibles where Jesus says, for example, I will draw all men to myself, from John, that God has put a void pointing to himself in each person, that there is eternity in their hearts from Ecclesiastes. And the classic passage in Romans chapter 1, what is known about God is plain because God has shown it to all so they are without excuse. So while it is true that salvation is primarily, essentially, God seeking us, that it is absolutely necessary that God is the one who woos us, who draws us, who brings us and treats us to be reconciled, who opens our eyes up to him. Yes, 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 that's all true. It's also true that God holds man responsible and capable of making a decision to accept or reject him. Because God has put us all in a place where we can find him, this just said. He is not far from you. And he is also not far from the person in Mongolia or North Korea or Cuba or a home in Manhattan where God is mocked and misunderstood. And if that person in Mongolia or Manhattan 
never moves from their self-centered life to grope for the truth. And if the good news of Jesus dying for their sins never penetrates their understanding, and then if they are, after life is over, condemned to pay the just consequences of their sins, unforgiven. You know what? If that person in Mongolia or Manhattan with the same heart had been born to a godly family, grown up in the church, heard the good news clearly, they would have rejected Jesus just the same, like many people are doing today. And the Bible says, actually, their condemnation would be greater after hearing the gospel over and over and not accepting it. In the same way, God will reveal himself to anyone in Mongolia or Manhattan who is seeking him. God can use any means he wants. He could send them a missionary. He could, they could tune into the radio or the Internet. They could have a dream or a vision. They could, have, uh, they could be somewhere in Ukraine, and someone could adopt them, bring them to the U.S. There are many, many ways God reveals himself to those people. He is not far from them. They, there's a capability in every person that God says, I put you here and I want you to seek me. Uh, Jan and I were just uh, at a, my first ever baby shower. You know, usually it's ladies that go to baby showers. But we were invited our grand niece to be, or grand nephew to be, had a baby shower. But while we were there, we just saw our grand niece for the first time. She's months old, Hannah. Hannah's got some challenges. She's already had heart surgery, and she has Downs. Um, so can she seek God and find God? All I know from the Scripture is God put Hannah in a time and place that's best for her to seek God. And God is not far from Hannah. Just like he's not far from you or far from me or anyone else. God is not unfair to the person in Mongolia or Manhattan, even though it seems to us that they can't hear the gospel clearly, because he has appointed a place and time for every person who has ever lived so that they might seek God and perhaps might reach out and find him. And you know what? He is not far from every single person on this earth. Paul continues in verse 28 and 29. Let me just stop before I move on. God put each person in the best place for them. That's what it means that God so loved the world. God put each person in the best place for them. We just need to accept that and believe it. Verse 28 and 29, Paul says, For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Think about this for a minute. Paul just quoted some pagan Greek poet. From the manuscript research that people have done, it was either a man named Aratus or possibly a guy named Cleanthes, both of whom lived like 300 years before Paul. They were both writing about the Greek god Zeus. Now, why would Paul bring up some long ago poet? This would be like today, he's going into a sermon and saying, listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Borea. You're like, oh, that's great, but why is he doing that? <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the point there? Does that make you uncomfortable that a Greek poet is sitting right there in your Bible? Hmm. I mean, what if Pastor Larry one day starts quoting Taylor Swift or Sigmund Freud? Wouldn't you say, you know, can we get back to Moses or David or at least go back to Spurgeon, you know, if, if you're not quoting the Bible, right? But why are you doing these people? So why is that relevant? It wasn't relevant to Paul because the unnamed poet was godly. No, 
It was because Paul found some things. He found a point that the poet made that, number one, connected with his audience. Number two, it was true for the small piece that Paul quoted. The rest of the hymn to Zeus, not very true. <laughs> but that part, we are his offspring, was. And then three, it enabled Paul to more fully present the gospel. So look, this poet said something that was right. Okay, this happens by God's common grace he gives to all people. We get things right sometimes. Even if we're not saved, people get things right sometimes. And it's acceptable to endorse those specific things which line up with Scripture, even when made by people who don't otherwise line up with Scripture. Okay, you get the difference there? This small point is okay. Paul knew this, and the Holy Spirit, through Dr. Luke writing this down, put it in your Bibles for all of you to see. Some Greek poet there. Let me... Um, Go on a side street for an application here. Sometimes our worship band and then we, we sing songs. Some of those songs, you know, are written by people who don't have maybe all of their theology straight. Sometimes those songs are written by people who may have some issues in their lives regarding holiness. And you know what? We still sing the songs. And, you know what? and I commend this as okay, because if the song is true, we sing the song. We discard the chaff and keep the wheat. We work out the dross and keep the gold. So keep singing the songs, Overflow and Stasis Bible Church. All right, we're back off the side street. We're back here. Paul says we're, we're God's offspring. If we're God's offspring, God can't be made out of gold or silver or stone because like God made us and then we made gold and silver and stone so God can't be made of silver and that would be not logical Paul says he says you guys get that God made us we make we make the silver stone God he says God's God's not in the stone guys so you're all through to an unknown God I want to proclaim to you the real truth okay not silver and stone verse 30 Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The gospel. Jesus came to save the world. One day he will judge the world. On what evidence do we assert that this is true? Because he rose from the dead the dead. It's the fact on which our faith rises or falls. That was the message of Easter Sunday morning from the women at the tomb, from John and Peter, from the travelers on the road to Emmaus, from the 500 other people who saw Jesus alive, and from the dramatically changed life of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, and from many, many other people since if Christ did not raise from the dead, Paul says to his friends in Corinth, we are the most pitiful creatures alive, running our whole lives based on a piece of fiction. If Jesus isn't raised, we are some pretty silly people. So if the people you and I meet are skeptical, skeptical about following God, I recommend we focus on one piece of evidence. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. The evidences for the resurrection, there are many countless scholars have written volumes. You can go look them up everywhere. But if your friends can begin to wrestle with, oh, there's facts of history. I need to deal with this. I need to look this up. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Maybe they will be groping and reaching out to find God. And he will not be far from them to find. Paul got to the bottom line. Verse 32, we have the reaction. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, eh, we'd like to hear from you again about this. 
So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Marsilian, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Some believed. Some mocked. Some needed eh, more time to think about it. Paul took in Dionysius and Damaris. He left the others, but he was likely to come, do you think, engage them later when they wanted to hear more? The ones who ridiculed him, well, that's, that's kind of part of life, right? Jesus was ridiculed. Paul was ridiculed. You and I might get ridiculed. Is, is, is that so horrible that we can't face it? I mean, we better not do it because we might get ridiculed. I, I hope it's not so horrible that we can't do it. So in conclusion, I encourage us here to use Paul's template. Think about that as a template for you and I going out into the world of people that we meet. In summary, if we can get it down to a few points, bring some salt, give out some salt, make them thirsty. How can I make this person want to hear the gospel? Number two, what Paul said, know your neighbors well enough. I mean, Paul went out and found out some Greek poetry of 300 years ago. Got well read enough in what these guys, these Epicurean Stoic philosophers were thinking about and said, let me understand them a little bit. And I can talk to them. So know your neighbors well enough. Find out what makes them tick. Get their point of interest. Number three, adapt our methods. Adapt our procedures. Use whatever we can do. But keep the same bottom line. Whatever your procedure, you come back to not the discussions about the flood or this or evolution or these things, the resurrection from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Core message, core thing, core template from Paul that I think we can use. I've asked uh, Steve Quinn if he's going to come up and close in prayer here in a minute. Our approach to people might be this. Here's what Paul said. There is a God who made the world and everything in it. In him we live and move and have our being. Here's our message to people. God commands everywhere people to repent because he's set a day when he's going to judge the world by his son Jesus. And he's provided proof of that to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. And God has determined a time, a place, a boundary of exactly where you are going to live. And you know why he did this? So that you might seek him and reach out and try and find him. Because he's not very far from each and every one of us. Let's see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for stepping down from glory to die for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for eternal life through you. And these things I pray in your precious name. Amen. Creation, there at the 
we the test or something today? I, at, I would say at the very least, uh, we all have neighbors. Uh, it's gonna be the easiest place to start from. Just if, if you haven't really at least extend like a hand of friendship, you haven't gotten to know them, start with that first. Have something in common where you'll be able to communicate and actually be a good friend to begin with and then be able to share the good news with them at the same time. You're dismissed.